In this sermon, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. We'll read the word, and then we'll get into the explanation and application of the word of God. Hear God's holy word. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. In being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that'll be, that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your holiness, your majesty, your grace. We praise you for the gift of your Son, who lived a holy life in honor to you. And we praise you for the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, come down, teach us, guide us, we ask, according to your word, in Jesus' good name. Amen. Have you ever heard the expression, gird your loins? You've probably only heard this expression if you have read the Bible. And if you have the King James Version or the New American Standard Version, and you're reading 1 Peter 1.13, it says, Gird up the loins of your mind. But what on earth does girding your loins mean? Well, I found a description of girding your loins of all places on a website called theartofmanliness.com and it gives you a step-by-step -step definition of girding your loins. Let us listen and learn. Back in the days of the ancient, ancient Near East, both men and women wore flowing tunics. Around the tunic they'd wear a belt or a girdle. While tunics were comfortable and breezy, the hem of the tunic often would often get in the way it, when a man was fighting or performing intense labor. So this is how you deal with it. First, you hoist the tunic up so all the fabric is above your knees. This will give you mobility. Two, you gather the extra material in front of you so that the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. Once the excess fabric is gathered in front, pull it underneath between your legs and to your rear this feels much like a diaper. Gather half of the material in each hand, bringing it back to the round of the front. Finally, tie your two hands and material together. And then you're all set for both battle and some hard labor. Go forth, be men, and gird your loins. Because their loins were girded, they were able to do the necessary moves for battle and for hard work. Now, no one listening is wearing a tunic, so none of us need to gird our loins. But Peter is giving us some special and important application for our minds. So are you willing to gird the loins of your mind, or are you going to be a daydreamer in your Christian life? Now I remember when I was in public school, I used to daydream all the time. I'd sit and think about this, I'd think about that, I'd think about hockey, I'd think about playing after school. And because I was daydreaming and not preparing my mind for action, it reflected in my school grades. Let's be prepared for action in our minds with regards to the gospel and the commands that God has given us. Peter wrote this letter to the five churches. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia to encourage them in their Christian faith. Peter encouraged them with the good news of Jesus Christ and the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Peter also exhorted them to live a holy life because Jesus had changed their lives. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 12, Peter writes about all the amazing reasons why we ought to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's given us a new birth into a living hope. Praise the Lord. We have this hope of heaven. And furthermore, God keeps us in this grace and seals this hope for us till his second coming. Praise the Lord. We can rejoice in our sufferings because those sufferings produce in us character and hope. 
Praise the Lord. God has given us the Old Testament to teach us the importance about the sufferings of Jesus Christ and the hope of the gospel. And now we come to this next section where Peter exhorts these Christians to live a holy life found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. And we're just going to be looking at chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. And we have three points. First, verse 13, we need to have complete hope in your mind, in our minds. Verse 14, conformed to Christ, not according to the world. And verse 15 to 16, we are called to holiness. Let's look at complete hope in your mind. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see that very important word again, the therefore. So we must ask what the therefore is therefore. Paul uses this word therefore to go back and to remind the readers all the wonderful grace that is given to them by God. Therefore, because of this new birth, the grace of God the living hope, they are to live holy lives. Because God gives us this grace and all these amazing blessings, that's why we are to live holy lives. We don't live holy lives and that attempts to make us Christian. God saves us, praise the Lord. We're able by God's grace to live a holy life. And Peter gives three commands in light of this new birth and living hope. First, they are to prepare your minds for action. As I've already mentioned, the original Greek calls this girding the loins of your minds. This means that we're commanded to be mentally prepared for the action of obedience to the Lord. If you're going to fight somebody, you're prepared. You have your dukes up and thus you're ready to fight. And because Jesus Christ has saved us, we must be ready with our minds to be focused upon Christ, focused upon obedience to Him. It's not a time for sleeping. Number two, He calls us to be sober-minded. Now, sober-minded is the actual opposite of drunkenness. So sober-minded has this idea of avoiding drunkenness. And you know how people act when they are drunk. I met some people recently who were drunk, and they were absolutely drunk out of their minds. They could barely walk, they could barely talk, they could barely do basic tasks. In fact, one seriously drunk person fell over, he couldn't even walk, blacked out, and he didn't know what at all what was going on. Can you imagine being so out of control in your Christian life that you can't carry out the basic task of obedience. But God calls us to be disciplined and to be self-controlled in our Christian life and not out of control, being controlled by the flesh. This word sober-minded is actually used two more times in the book of 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter calls these Christians to be sober-minded so they can pray. 1 Peter 4 verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter next calls these Christians to be sober-minded so that they can stand against the devil's schemes. Be attentive. Don't be sleeping. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. As Christians, we are called to be a people who avoid spiritual and mental drunkenness and live lives of self-control so that we are ready for obedience to God. And the third command, set your hope fully. They're finally commanded in this verse to have full hope in the grace that God gives to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This means they are to be confident in the second coming of Christ. And what will happen at the second coming of Christ? 
they will experience and know the fullness and the grace of the goodness of God. We must allow the eternal hope to be our greatest joy and set our minds and our lives upon it. So we're to have complete hope in our mind, verse 13. Let's look at verse 14. Conformed to Christ. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Peter reminds us of two amazing truths that are connected to being a Christian here. First, we are children of God. And next, God has saved us from those sinful passions of the past. First, let's look at we are children of God. We are reminded that God has called us. He has chosen us. He's elected us. And brought us into his family. Therefore, we belong as Christians to the family of God. And therefore, we are to be obedient children, thus obedient to God. Now, some have said, even to me recently, that they see obedience as just a thing of the law, Law is no big deal. I'm into love. I want to love God. I don't need to necessarily obey God. Well, God has loved the Christian and included them in the family of God. And since we belong to the family of God, thus we must act like family and thus be obedient children to our loving Father. Next, God has saved us from the sinful passions of the past. Because he says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. When Jesus saves us, he gives us a new heart. And new longing for holiness. So therefore, we must not allow our sinful desires that we gave into the past, that ruled our lives in the past, to rule our lives now. We are free because Christ Jesus has set us free, praise the Lord. Therefore, we must no longer live in a way that's connected to our old sinful past. These sinful desires will rear their heads often. But we must flee from these sinful desires and come and trust and cling to Christ. And let's look at this third point. Call to holiness. Verses 15 to 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And this verse teaches us two important truths. First, an important truth about the Lord. An important truth, number two, about the Christian life. First, God is holy. And number two, Christians are to live holy lives. First, let's look at the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the moral purity of God. This means that God cannot look upon sin... There's no sin in God. God is not capable of sinning because he's holy. He's perfect. He's morally pure. There's no sin found in God. He's too pure even to look upon evil. Now many passages teach us about the holiness of God in the Old Testament. We're going to look at a few. The first is Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 to 20. This is the passage where Moses sees the burning bush and is called by God. And do you remember what the Lord says to Moses when he comes near the bush? In Exodus 3 verse 5, Don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet. The place we are, where you are standing is holy ground. The Lord was there. And therefore, everything around it was holy. Because the Lord is a holy God. The next section of scripture I think of is Psalm 99. I call this psalm the psalm of the great one. Now the famous hockey player Wayne Gretzky had the number 99 on his jersey and was called the great one. But do we know that Psalm 99 declares that the Lord is truly the great one? Three verses in Psalm 99 say something. We'll read verse 3 of Psalm 99. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Psalm 99 verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. 
In Psalm 99, verse 9, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 99 declares that the Lord indeed is holy once, holy twice, holy three times. Holy, holy, holy. This means that there is no one holy like the Lord. The Lord is holiest. He stands alone with no one in view of His holiness. And Psalm 99 declares truly that the Lord is holy and truly that the Lord is the only great one. I also think of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. Isaiah teaches the holiness of God without any apology. Isaiah 6, 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two they covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And the one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations and the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Do you see how Isaiah responds to the holiness of God here? He responds with humility, sorrow for sin. And do you remember back to Exodus chapter 3, how Moses responds to God when he sees this bush and he recognizes and knows that he's in the presence of a holy God. Moses is afraid to look at God. Why do Isaiah and Moses respond to God with fear and humility? Because the Lord is a holy God who is without sin. And all of us are not holy. We are sinful. We are sinful to the core, but saved by grace. And this brings us to our next point of application. The holiness of the Christian. Peter calls us to be holy in all that we do as Christians. God is holy and we are to live our lives in obedience to God and thus in holiness. And this means that we order our lives according to God. We order our lives according to the Word of God, His ways. We obey the Lord in everything that we do. Paul is even so bold to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 7, that it is our calling to be holy. And that is the will of God, our holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification or your holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And Peter continues this section by quoting the book of Leviticus, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. The reason that we are to be holy is because that's according to God's holiness and according to his holy word. This verse is a direct quote from three passages in the book of Leviticus. First, Leviticus 14, 44 to 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not divide yourselves with any of the swarming thing that crawls on the ground, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land out of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And Leviticus 19, verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And finally, Leviticus 20, verse 7. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. 
Now, when you read the book of Leviticus, one of the main themes in the book of Leviticus is the holiness of God. We see the holiness of God as he pours out his wrath upon Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10. We see all these demands from God that are given to the people of God and they're to obey to the T because he is a holy God. And because the Lord is holy, we are called to live holy lives as well. Let me give you another encouragement to get into the Old Testament. Because when you do, you will see the purity, the majesty, the glory, and the holiness of God. When you read the Old Testament, you will see that God truly cannot look upon sin with any sort of pleasure because he is holy. Well, what does this, what do these Four verses actually mean to our lives and what do they apply? How do they apply? Number one, is the new birth in the living hope of Jesus joy to you? In the book of First Peter, we just can't miss the blessings of the new birth and the living hope that is offered to us in the person and work of Christ. In First Peter 1 3, we see the very important word, that therefore word that reminds us of what Peter has already said about the salvation that has come to us in Jesus Christ. That salvation had to come because all humans have a serious problem, and that problem is our sin. Although society tries to sanitize sin and tries to turn evil into good and good into evil, the Lord is a holy God who hates sin. We as humans are all just like Adam and Eve, who were tainted by sin. The problem of sin is nothing new. We see the serious problem of sin with Adam and Eve, and that problem continues to the present day. When you turn on the news, you rarely see stories about godliness. You often see a continuation of what we call human sinfulness or human depravity. But this is why Jesus Christ had come. And Paul writes about the extreme importance of Jesus Christ as, to, as he came to rescue us from our sin in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Who can save us? From this body of death, no one but Jesus. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 3, 12, we hear about all the wonderful grace that Jesus has given to us that we are most unworthy to receive. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, the Holy Spirit sanctifies. The Christian is made holy by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian is sprinkled by the blood of Christ. Because of Christ's work on the cross, the Christian is cleansed from all their sins. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter writes about the mercy that is given to us by God. No one deserves this mercy and grace from God, but God gives us his grace, so let us praise the Lord. Peter also mentions that these Christians are born again. These Christians were dead in sin, but God made them alive again. They passed from death to life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, Peter reminded these Christians uh, that the sufferings of Christ that were brought about for their salvation. Jesus suffered for sinners. Jesus bore the sins of many so that their sin record could be erased and they could be restored back to God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, Peter reminds these, good, these Christians of the good news that was preached to them. And this is the good news that saved them through Jesus Christ. Today, if you're a Christian, this message of hope and grace through yours is yours through Christ. Your sins, yes, they were many, but the mercy of God is much, much more. You know the marvelous grace of our loving Lord, the grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Praise the Lord for these amazing blessings of grace. But if you're outside Jesus Christ and his grace, and you don't know Jesus Christ, 
Don't stay where you are any longer, apart from God, separate from God, living in sin, in a life of no hope and in despair. Look to Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for you. Just look at the wonderful promises for sinners, even in this passage, if you but turn and trust Christ alone. So trust Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. Leave your sin and lean upon Christ alone for mercy and grace. Next, Christian, rejoice in the work of God in you. Although this passage gives us many commands, we also see our wonderful position in Jesus Christ. We're reminded that we belong to Christ because of God's grace. We are not Christians because we live a holy life. We are, live a holy life because Christians are saved by grace. And Peter gives this, search, this church several commands, but he also reminds them of the grace given to them in Jesus Christ. Again, we belong to the family of God. Peter calls this church obedient children. In order to be obedient child, you must belong to the family of God. And since you've been given this new birth into a living hope, you now belong to the family of God. The Lord is your God. You are his child. The Lord who made the universe, the Lord who is holy, the Lord who is majestic, is your Father, is your God. Praise the Lord because of his grace given to us. We belong to him. Next, the Christian has been delivered from their former passions. Peter exhorts these Christians, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. If you are a Christian, you've been delivered from your past sins. In the past, you used to walk in the way of sin. You used to walk in the way of darkness. But now, because of Christ, you can forsake the sin, those former passions, and live for Christ. And finally, God called these Christians. Peter says that a holy God called them. These Christians were chosen by grace. God invaded their lives and their lives were changed forever. The believers addressed by Peter were not Christians because of all the things they have done. They were believers because of God's amazing grace to them. If you're a Christian listening, these realities are are also yours. Christian, you belong to the family of God. Christian, you've been delivered from your past sins of ignorance so that you can live in wisdom for Jesus Christ and live for Him alone. And Christian, you've been called and saved by God. Because of all these amazing blessings and graces, let this fuel our obedience. If you're struggling with the sin, preach the good news of Jesus to yourself. If you're struggling with the sin, why not get into the book of 1 John and read about the grace of Christ? God saves us by grace, but he also empowers us to live a holy life by grace. All glory to God for his grace. And Christian, of course, live a holy life. I recognize that holiness to the Lord is the last idea that might be preached to you if you watch TV or you're surfing the internet. And so it's not something that's in our culture's mind at all. But to Peter declares to us that God is holy. And we, are, are, we as Christians are to reflect the holiness of God in our lives. And if we're not living holy lives reflecting the holiness of God then we should wonder if the holy God has truly called us. The command in this section is actually very similar to Paul's command to the church at Rome found in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 2. I'll read that to you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let us no longer give any part of our body to sin. Let's present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. So let's be pure and holy in our eyes and what we see. 
Let us be pure and holy with our ears and what we hear. Let us be pure in our minds and what we think. Let us be pure in our mouths and what we speak. Let us be pure in our hearts and what we desire. Let us be holy in every area of our life, just as the Lord is holy. Thanks for watching and God bless.